It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Acer Predator XB253QGP's OSD on-screen display menu system. The system is controlled by pressable buttons and a joystick at the rear of the monitor, towards the right side as viewed from in front. If you press the first button, the top button, that's the power button, so you can turn the monitor on or off. You'll see that when it turns on, it has this splash screen, but you can get rid of that so it starts up quicker if you prefer. There's an option for that in the OSD, which I'll come on to shortly. The second button down, you can actually see when you press one of these buttons what everything's going to do. So first is modes, second is brightness, third is input. You can actually customise some of these in the OSD, as I'll show you shortly. But the modes, first of all, you've got... Action, Racing and Sports, G1, G2 and G3, and these offer you full flexibility, as does that user setting. And there's also standard Eco Graphics and HDR. HDR is a little bit different, so I'll come on to that shortly, but standard is just the factory defaults, Eco is dimmer than the factory defaults, and Graphics is a lot brighter than the factory defaults. Graphics is a bit strange because it sets the brightness to 97 by default. I'm not sure why they didn't just go for the full 100 there. It's a bit of a strange setting to use. Um, but of course, you can just manually adjust the brightness in any of these presets. And if you do adjust something, so you can see it says mode standard now. If I were to adjust anything, for example, the brightness, it switches over to the user mode. And that's really how this works. So all of these presets, except for HDR, which again, I'll come on to shortly, they have the same set of settings and anything you change here will then just flick it onto the user mode. So to save things as G1, G2 or G3, you can just go on any of these. So just for simplicity, I'll go back to the factory default standard setting. Now I'll change the brightness to 70 instead of the default of 65. And then when you go back to the menu subsections, so I'm selecting picture, color, audio, etc. It says save settings to. And this is where you can save it as game mode action, game mode racing, or game mode sports. I'll show you how I've set mine up shortly. So I'm not going to overwrite these because I've got them set up quite nicely for my own use. The HDR mode then, it's a bit different. You'll notice that when you activate this, it takes a little bit longer to activate. The screen does go off for a while before springing back to life. If you're running with an SDR signal, as I am now, I'm just on my desktop, I haven't got HDR active on my computer, but you'll see in the menu you don't have access to most things, so you can adjust the brightness, but you can't adjust things like your colour channels, and you'll see colour space is set to HDR. This is just another way of turning the monitor onto its HDR setting, even if it does act as an emulation mode. This monitor is a bit strange in the sense that if you activate HDR, it doesn't automatically switch to the HDR mode. I was, of course, on the HDR mode myself manually before, but if I was on standard or user or anything else, it would just stay there and you'd have to manually select the HDR mode just to show you what things would look like if you didn't do that. Completely washed out, really odd, and you'll know straight away that you haven't selected to the correct setting. So you do have to manually select the HDR mode as well as activating the HDR signal. In this mode, you now have lots of restriction like you did before with the HDR emulation setting, except you can't adjust brightness. Strange thing is though, you can adjust brightness before you've entered this mode, and then it will pay attention to the setting you used when you have the full HDR signal. So you'd go onto the HDR mode without your HDR signal, you can set the brightness to whatever you want, then when you get the HDR signal, it will pay attention to that. To be honest, 100 or close to it's really the closest you'll get to an HDR-like brightness on this monitor, but I do explore this in the review anyway. This is just an OSD video, so I won't say too much more about that. So you've then got your brightness control, you've got your input select, fairly self-explanatory, or you can have it automatically select the input for you if you prefer to do that. If you want it manually selected, you just turn auto source off. And now onto the main menu. So you can see it's split into the various sections I showed you just before. Pictures first, so you've got your brightness, your contrast control. Blue light, this is a low blue light setting. So you can set that to 50%, which is the strongest setting. That gives you supposedly a 50% reduction in blue light. I mean, it does actually depend on the brightness you've got set. 
By default, this has a lower brightness than the other blue light settings, but you can manually adjust that yourself. And if you reduce the brightness further, then you're going to have a greater reduction in blue light output and indeed all light output from the monitor. So 60 is a bit stronger, 70% stronger again, 80% stronger again. I like 50% for my own personal use and I use this with reduced brightness in the evening where it's good to minimize blue light exposure because it disrupts your sleep hormones and that kind of thing. And this would be a neat time to tell you actually. So the G3 setting there, I use that as my low blue light setting with reduced brightness. However, because I've been fiddling around with the blue light filter with the user setting there, the user mode, it doesn't actually have that active now, although I did have it active when I saved the preset. So you have to be aware that not everything here will save to this preset. So certain things are universal, such as the color channel adjustments, and also some of these gaming settings, VRB and adaptive sync, that's all applied universally. So it doesn't save absolutely everything, your preferences for on or off for various things, or your color channels, blue light adjustments, that kind of thing. So if you adjust these settings, they won't be remembered for your particular G1, G2 or G3 setting. But you can see I had a reduced brightness, 26%, and I had this set to 50%, so that will change the default brightness to 60, so I'd have to reduce that again to 26. So these are the kind of settings I like to use just for my personal viewing comfort in the evening. Everyone has their own preferences. Um, I do explore the low blue light settings a bit more in the written review and they are very effective, especially this 50% one. It gives a bit of a green tint. Some low blue light settings will reduce the green colour channel, but that does come at the expense of contrast. So I now want to resave this. Save settings to as game mode sports. So there you go, it says game mode sports saved. Next you've got black boost. So this is a gamma enhancement feature designed to raise the visibility for dark areas to give you a competitive edge in games or whatever else you might be doing if you want to raise the black levels. So five is the default. If you raise that to six, you'll see that these darker shades lighten up. It doesn't just affect the dark shades, it does have an effect on other shades as well. And the background there is pure black and it does actually raise the black point. So you do lose contrast if you activate this setting. Increasing this to six is fairly gentle, so it's a bit more granular, so to speak, than some other settings of this nature, which I've seen on some other monitors. I wouldn't say it's the best implementation, because ideally it wouldn't affect the black point, and it does kind of wash the image out quite notably, not just for the dark shades, but elsewhere as well. If you reduce that, then you start to get things crushed together, a loss of distinction for those dark shades and other shades indeed. It basically makes things look quite dull and a bit strange to be honest but some people might like that look so you can adjust that if you want. I'd recommend instead playing with the gamma settings before fitting around with this because they don't affect the contrast but they can have a similar effect so they can increase your visibility in the dark areas and that kind of thing. Next is ACM which I believe stands for Adaptive Contrast Management. This is a dynamic contrast feature that's explored in the written review so that allows the backlight to adjust according to the scene just the brightness levels itself according to the scene brightness, but it's all just one black light. There's no local dimming, so it's a bit of a compromise really. It's explored in the written review. HDR, so this is just another way of activating that HDR mode, which I showed you earlier. There's actually a few different settings, but they do exactly the same thing. There's off, which is fairly self-explanatory. It's not enabled. Or there is HDR 400, so that's VESA Display HDR 400 level. Or there's auto, which is exactly the same because the only other mode that this monitor has is the HDR 400 level. Of course, on some Acer models, there would be higher levels of HDR and you might be able to select a lower level there, which is why this applies. But on this model, it seems to just be exactly the same whether you've got it set to auto or HDR 400 here. Next is super sharpness, and this is just a sharpness filter, which will over sharpen things. It actually gives you a similar filter effect to what you'd get with quite a few monitors under HDR normally and this can help accentuate some things but it's just personal preference whether you want this enabled or not. Most people, and this would include me, I would just leave this off but it's there if you want to use it. Next there's colour and there's various gamma settings. I'll just start from the beginning. There's 1.8, 2.0, 2.2, 2.4 and 2.6 
And on my unit, these did actually correspond to the correct average gammas, so they were well implemented. Color temp, you can set that to user if you want to manually configure the red, green, and blue color channels. The RGB gain is your main color controls, the kind of standard RGB you'd have on most monitors. You can also change the bias, which is really more of a TV feature, but they do have it here. But this kind of just changes the changes how much this shade is represented, really. Highly technical explanation there. But you can see what it does when you just fiddle around with these. I don't see a reason to adjust these on this monitor, so I would just keep them at 50. But of course, the gains are your main red, green, and blue color channels. You may well want to change them. There's warm, which is just the factory default. It's not actually warm, it's just warmer than some of the other settings. And next there's normal, which funnily enough isn't normal because it's not the standard that's warm, as I mentioned just before. But this is cooler than the warm setting. There's cool, which is even cooler. And by cool and cooler, I mean it has a much higher white point, and actually very high at this point, so things really look very icy and strange. But that's what that's for. And there's the blue light setting, which I've explored before. And of course, you can go into picture. You don't need to have blue light necessarily activated here to be able to go into picture and then change the setting there. It will automatically shunt you onto the blue light setting for color if you change the percentage of blue light here. There are also some other settings if you scroll down here in the color. So there's modes, which I've already gone through. They're the preset modes. Color space. It's quite interesting, actually. So there's standard, which is just the factory default. sRGB, which is an sRGB emulation mode, and that's explored in the review. This just cuts down on the gamut a bit. The color gamut only extends a little bit beyond sRGB anyway, but this makes it really very strictly adhere to sRGB. At least it doesn't have any noticeable over coverage, so that could be potentially useful. Rec 709 is another sRGB emulation setting, but the gamma target here is 2.4. And be aware that if you're in the sRGB or the Rec 709 modes, um, color space modes, then you can't scroll up here. So you can't change your color channels. And you also have the contrast locked off and various other settings locked off. So it does restrict you, but you can adjust the brightness, which is of course the main control of importance. If you're going to be using this kind of emulation setting. The next one is HDR, so this is going to shunt me off the menu because it activates this mode and it takes a while, and I've already gone through the HDR setting. The next setting is EBU, and again it's going to shunt me off the menu because it's going to deactivate this HDR setting. So there's EBU for work within the EBU color space. DCI, this is a strange one because this monitor doesn't have a DCI-P3 color gamut. So what this does is, is a digital saturation boost. It doesn't expand the color gamut, but it pushes things close to the edge of the gamut, or pulls if you prefer, and that crushes things together. You lose a lot of shade variety, and it increases the saturation of shades which are not the most saturated that the monitor is displaying. So basically things look oversaturated, kind of cartoonish, not natural. So this doesn't really have much utility, and it certainly isn't a proper representation or a remotely accurate representation of the DCI-P3 color space. SMPTEC, so this again changes your gamma target, it changes various other things, your color space as well, so it is more, perhaps more suitable for work within the SMPTEC color space. And then back to standard again. There's grayscale mode, so this will just make everything grayscale. Six axis hue adjustment, so this gives you some fine control over your hues. And again, I don't see any reason to change these, but if you like to tweak things at this level, you certainly can. This is a flexibility you are afforded on this monitor. So you can see there's red, green, blue, yellow, magenta, and cyan, or you can reset these to the factory defaults. It's the same for saturation. And again, this isn't gonna expand your gamut, so if you increase these, you're gonna lose shade variety. But I know some people, just according to their tastes, they might prefer these to be increased a bit or potentially decreased a bit. So feel free to play around with these. Again, you've got red, green, blue, yellow, magenta, and cyan. Or you can reset these to the factory defaults. Next is audio, which allows you to change the volume of the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5mm headphone jack, or mute those. 
I would say about the speakers, they're not particularly good. They're very basic. They're just two two watt speakers. And even at full volume, it's not actually very loud. I mean, they're kind of usable if you really need to use them, but they're really not going to replace a decent set of headphones or standalone speakers. Next up, there's gaming. Overdrive, that is disabled. That control is disabled if you've got adaptive sync enabled. A little bit peculiar though, because a little bit like the brightness I showed you when you had an SDR color signal, but you were with the HDR mode, you can actually adjust this when you're outside of adaptive sync. So you've got adaptive sync off as normal, extreme or off. And this does get a bit confusing because of how they've implemented it, but these are explored in the written review and I would definitely refer to that for a better explanation. But I think sometimes demonstrating this can be quite useful as well. So if you set this to off or extreme and then enable adaptive sync, it will be as if it's set to off. And if you have this set to normal and then enable adaptive sync, it is just as if it's set to normal. So in other words, you can't use the extreme setting when you've got adaptive sync active, which is no huge loss because the extreme setting is terrible. You just get a load of overshoot. It looks really unsightly and horrible. Basically, these are explored in the review, but what I've done, um, because it can be a bit of a pain in the backside to change between these when you've got adaptive sync enabled, and especially when you're in a game, what I've done is I've actually created two identical settings for G1 and G2, so sets of settings. So G1 is just my test settings, G2 is my test settings. The only difference is that with G1 I've got the overdrive set to normal, and racing I've got the overdrive set to off, both with adaptive sync active. Why might I want to do that? Well, it's really it's explored in the review, and that's because I find that normal works very nicely when the monitor is running at really high frame rates when you've got adaptive sync on, so close to 144 or at 144 frames a second. Whereas as that reduces, you get increasing levels of overshoot and it really becomes a nicer state to have overdrive disabled or set to off. So it's nice to be able to quickly switch between them, action and racing or G1 and G2 to get those different states. It's a much cleaner way of doing it. So it's a nice flexibility you have, but I think it's a little bit weird that Ace has actually blocked this control off. I understand why they've done it if they don't want you to use Extreme when you've got Adaptive Sync active, but I think there's probably a more elegant way of doing this without confusing people so much. And also to mention, you can actually use Ace's display widget software, which I'll show you shortly, to change the overdrive mode after you've got Adaptive Sync enabled. But again, they'll just respond as I mentioned before. So you've either got off or extreme, which will set it to off, or you've got normal, which will set it to normal. If you're still awake and engaged after that very long and tedious explanation, well done. Ultra low latency, this was something which was also greyed out when I had adaptive sync enabled. This is just the low input lag mode. Activating this doesn't have an effect on image quality, but it does potentially lower your input lag. What I would say is, don't worry about this. If you've got adaptive sync on, it doesn't matter what you set this to, it will always be enabled. It will have ultra low latency whilst adaptive sync is on. But if you've got adaptive sync off, I would just leave this set to on for the lowest level of input lag without any negative effects. There's refresh rate num, and what that will do is it will give you an indication of the refresh rate at the top right corner of the screen. If you've got adaptive sync enabled, that will correspond to the frame rate of the content as the refresh rate should be matching that. So it can be a very useful indication just that the technology is working, adaptive sync is working, and the refresh rate is changing as the frame rate changes. Next there's VRB, visual response boost, and you need to have the monitor set either to 85 or 120 hertz for this to be enabled. And I will show you what this does, but I need to give you a warning that it's gonna cause the monitor to flicker. And that's all you're really going to see. So if you're sensitive to flickering, look away now. So I've got it set to 120 hertz. I'll now be able to enable VRB. So again, you're going to see flickering. You see, there was a very brief flickering, but the camera's actually filtered out very effectively. So you might be able to see a little bit of a shimmer on the screen, but you can't see the kind of strobes you can often see when you activate this setting, but it is causing the backlight to cycle at 120 hertz. And that 
is designed to reduce the perceived blur of the monitor. This is all explored in the written review in quite a bit of detail, so definitely refer to that. Next is aim point, which will put a little crosshair on the screen. Icon 1, icon 2, or icon 3, depending on what you've selected. So icon 1, just there, little white crosshair. You can't change where on the screen it's displayed, it's always in the centre. And you can't change the colour, it's always white. So that's the second icon there. And the third icon. Next is OSD, which allows you to change various settings pertaining to the OSD itself. So you can change the language it's displayed in. OSD timeout, so that's how long after the last button press before the OSD automatically collapses in on itself. We can just press the X button to get rid of it very quickly. You can set this between 10 and 120 seconds. Transparency, so that enables a transparency effect for the OSD. You can have that set up to 80% or disabled. I'm not really bothered about that either way. OSD lock, this is to stop pesky family members, usually younger family members, fiddling with your OSD very easily and messing around with your settings. So when you press a button now, you'll see it says OSD locked. How do you get rid of the OSD lock, I hear you ask? Well, I get asked this a lot in my videos, so I will go through it here because I get really sick of having to respond to these comments, no offense anyone, but it always says in the user manual, and in this case, you just press the joystick down for about five seconds, I think it is, and then it unlocks for you. I'm not sure if it needs to be the joystick or you can do it with another button, I'm not sure, but certainly if you just press the joystick in, it certainly does it. And then there's system, so you can change the input used by the monitor, DP or HDMI. Auto source, so that automatically selects the input for you, much as I showed you earlier, if you remember that far back. DisplayPort 1.4, DisplayPort 1.2. So DP 1.4 gives you the full capabilities of the monitor, including HDR. Whereas DP 1.2, if you've got an older GPU and it doesn't support DP 1.4, so it's really just for compatibility. Hotkey assignment, so this allows you to change the first two settings there, which I had set to modes and brightness, which are the factory defaults. You can change that to something else if you prefer, so you've got overdrive, blue light. Again, don't think that you're going to be able to quickly change this when you've got adaptive sync active, because again, it's just going to be greyed out. Then you've got contrast, gamma, volume, VRB, and back to modes again. So there's various different settings you can have there. See there, you can just quickly change the overdrive now. And that's only because I've got adaptive sync disabled. So just in case you don't believe me, I will enable adaptive sync. And you'll see that that's grayed out now. Next, you've got wide mode. You can set that to full, which will use all of your pixels on the screen, or you can set that to one-to-one. -to -one. And this doesn't apply when you're running the native resolution as I am now, but if you're running a non-native resolution, this will give you a black border and it will only use the pixels called for in the source resolution. So it'll give you an undistorted version of the resolution in a smaller section of the screen. Next is aspect ratio. So this is similar to the full setting, except that it will actually respect the aspect ratio of the source resolution you've selected. So if it isn't a 16 by 9 resolution, it will not distort that, whereas the full mode will just use all of the pixels regardless. But this aspect setting will still use as much of the screen as it can while still maintaining the correct aspect ratio. So it will use some interpolation, but it won't give you a distorted image or the incorrect aspect ratio. DDC slash CI, this allows you to use the full plug and play functionality of the monitor. More specifically, it allows you to use software to control the monitor, such as Asus Display Widget software, which I'll show you very shortly. HDMI black level, set that to normal in most cases, but if you need to, you can set that to limited or low, as they call it here, and that gives you a limited range RGB signal. So this might make sense for some systems, certain games consoles, for example where this is the signal that it wants to use. 
So that's why you can adjust this and you can do this. It says HDMI black level, but you can do it over DisplayPort as well. Quick start mode, that will get, get rid of that splash screen I showed you near the start of the video when you first turn the monitor on and make it start up a bit more quickly. So I've got it off now. And when you turn it on, then when you turn it on, it just pops up without showing you the splash screen. And you'll notice there's a little down arrow there, which means there's some further settings here. And just one more there. Power off USB charge. So that will just mean that you can charge things using the USB ports, even if you've got the monitor switched off. And by off, I don't mean unplugged from the wall or anything like that. Of course, that wouldn't give you power to the USB. Just if you've used the power button to turn the monitor off, then you'll be able to charge devices connected via USB. Why would you want to switch this off at all? Well, it will use fractionally more power if you set this to on, even if you don't have anything connected to the USB port. They're kind of like power leeches. You might have heard about this term um, for other things, but really it's just a fraction of a watt. I wouldn't really worry too much about it um, either way. As it happens, I don't charge things when the monitor's off via USB, so I just leave this set to off anyway. I'm now going to take a look at Asus Display Widget software. You don't need the USB cable connected to use this. It uses the DDC slash CI channel of the monitor instead. And that means it just uses the display connection to communicate. It doesn't give you the same flexibility that some monitor software gives you. It's very simple, very easy to use, very, very swift change between these presets here. You can see very quick, actually a lot quicker than it does in the OSD. The HDR one even, very quick. Quite surprisingly quick, actually. So if I go into the OSD now, it has actually activated the HDR mode properly. Just makes you wonder why it takes so long when you do it through the OSD, when it can do it this quickly here, but never mind, that's how it is. If you go in advanced settings, you can change various other things. So you've got your blue light settings, brightness, contrast, gamma settings, you see it doesn't list them all there, it's just 1.8, 2.2 and 2.4. So this is all kind of dumbed down, so to speak. It's simplified to make it easy to just see your main settings at a glance and change them. You can change the colour temperature. So you can see that they've got the gains here, but they don't have the biases. Again, just to simplify things, these are just the main controls. Black boost, volume, refresh rate num. So you can quickly activate or deactivate that. And the overdrive setting. And as I mentioned, I have got Adaptive Sync active at the moment but you can change these settings, but off and extreme are exactly the same, and they're both set to off, or there's normal, which is my preferred for the high refresh rate. It has a little thing there showing you the model number or the model series, XB253Q. Game view sync, this will just allow you to assign different preset modes to different applications. And you'll see that there aren't the G1, G2, and G3, which is a bit of a shame, just the remaining presets available here. But I could see this potentially being useful if you have a particular game that you always run in HDR, for example. You can have that set so it automatically switches to the HDR settings, so you don't have to manually do it. Although this is actually a flexibility that most monitors give you anyway, it's a bit odd that this doesn't have it. So you can add an app there, select the process of the running application, so anything that's running at the time, or you can just browse your computer and find an application by that way. Split screen, so various different ways of organizing your windows. So I've got my website and forum open at the same time at the moment. So you have to first turn this on, then you can have it so you can easily snap to various different positions with your windows. So you'll see it shades the window there, which will show you where you're gonna drag it to, where on the screen you can drag it to. So it just helps you organize them in various different ways. Some manufacturers, they'll actually allow you to, once you've snapped them into position, select these and they'll automatically rearrange for you, which is quite neat. But I think it's Dell that lets you do that from, from the ones I've tested anyway. But this one, you have to just change them yourself. I don't really know what that G means. G. Um, not sure, to be honest. Please let me know in the comments section if you have any idea what that big G means there. Or you can click on this nice little friendly user icon there. And I'm not entirely sure what that does either. I thought it would give you the ability to customize this or something, but maybe you do that in some other screen, which I haven't seen yet. So there's a cog icon here. Maybe there's settings that you can 
change here for that? Nope, doesn't seem to be. So again, you know, let me know in the comments section if you know what the G or this strange user icon means. Never mind. There's power. Very odd to have a power setting here. It does exactly what you'd expect. It uh, turns the monitor off. Um, so that's wonderful. And now to turn it back on, you need to use the power button. You can see there's a bit of a delay, even though it doesn't show the splash screen, it isn't an instant startup. So back onto those settings now. It's very odd to have a power setting here, but uh, they've added that anyway. Power indicator, you can't change that on this model. So there's a little blue LED. I should have really shown you that before, but I'll show you that now just before I completely forget. A little blue power indicator. On some models, you'd be able to disable that. On this one, you can't, which is why this is greyed out. And you can't lock the power key either to stop people using that. And you can have the application, the display widget software run at startup if you like, and always on top. Check for updates and reset all settings. So that's all of us to the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Acer XB253 QGP. Be sure to check out the full review on pcmonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.